A nation can survive its fools, and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within. about the wars, they've been wrong about jobs, they've been wrong about everything. The question is, are they stupid or do they have a plan? I actually think for the most part, they have a plan, but some are not too smart. Welcome to the Horrible Deplorable Show, the anti-globalist America First program dedicated to de-hoaxing the media and destroying the narrative. Here's your host, the founder and editor of The Daily Stir, Matt Wingard. Welcome to The Horrible Deplorable Show. I am Matt Wingard, The Horrible Deplorable, and with me as always is my friend, Doris Whaler. Hello, Doris. Hello, Matt. I want to welcome everyone from the Gab community and let you know that you can find these podcasts on iTunes and SoundCloud and Stitcher and Pocket Cast. We're on the 405media.com, and that plays at 5 p.m. on Saturday and Sundays, and disobedientmedia.com. I'm asking everyone listening to please go on iTunes and write a review. That would be very helpful if you would take the moment to do that. Well, the news of the day, or the week, I should say, is the health care vote and the ongoing kerfuffle between President Trump and Sessions. And the Sessions issue is the one that I want to start off by talking about. I want to say, first of all, that I am a huge Jeff Sessions fan. I'm I was a Jeff Sessions fan before Trump ever ran for office and that I had hoped that he would run for president and that I would have worked on his campaign if he had wor- if he had run- at least I had thought in my mind that I would probably go work for his campaign and I think I would have done it. But Jeff Sessions didn't run for president of the United States. Donald Trump did. So having said how much I love Jeff Sessions and that I was very pleased that Trump included him in his cabinet, although I would have preferred Jeff Sessions to be the Homeland Security Secretary. I have no problem with Jeff Sessions before he became Attorney General. I I think he's great. I'm a huge, huge fan. But Donald Trump is the one who ran for President of the United States. Donald Trump is the one who walked through a fiery hell for over a year, who took all the slings and arrows, who was run over and backed over and run over and backed over and run over and backed over for over a year, who lost hundreds of millions of dollars in business when all the elites and social justice warriors turned away from him. It is Donald Trump who put everything on the line to run, and it is Donald Trump who has my loyalty. That doesn't mean that I still don't love Jeff Sessions, but everyone works for Donald Trump. He's the President of the United States. So if you have some inkling about where I'm going on this argument between the two of them, I want to be very clear that it's all about President Trump, and everyone else works for him. There is only one indispensable person in this administration, and that is President Donald Trump. Now again... I love Jeff Sessions, but I agree completely with the president's frustration. Jeff Sessions should not have recused himself within days of taking office. And I think the problem here is is that Jeff Sessions is old school. As much as you hear me harp on the perfumed handkerchief Republicans, it's not that Jeff Sessions is with the Never Trumpers or the Globalists. He's most certainly not, but he's still partial to Queensberry's rules. He's still somebody who, God, God bless him, you know, he has a sense of dignity and a gentlemanly manner, and he wants to fight like a gentleman. When the people who oppose him and the president have no intention of fighting like gentlemen, and I believe that the president has an expectation of everyone that he hires that they will be a fighter. And I think he'd like them all to be fighters like he is. But even if they're not, at a minimum, they're expected to protect the president. So do you think that Sessions either has the skill or the will to take on corrupt Washington, D.C.? There's an excellent article by uh, Sundance on his website, Conservative Treehouse, about all of the swamp creatures that exist within the DOJ and the FBI and that Jeff Sessions has done very little to fire those people or to weed them out. He has not done a lot of... There's been a little house cleaning in, in, in his department, but not a lot. And I think the president is frustrated. I think the president is frustrated that 
Sessions' mistakes have led to an independent investigator in Mueller, someone who has hired about 17 people, all of them to a person are Bush people, swamp creatures, Hillary Clinton supporters, Hillary Clinton donors, Obama administration officials. I mean, it doesn't look good. And the president has every reason to be alarmed by that. I said from the beginning that the appointment of Mueller or any special investigator is a mistake. It's a key tool that the swamp uses to slowly drag down and strangle an administration. And Jeff Sessions is responsible for allowing all of that to happen. Now, I don't think he is part of the cabal that that wants to take down the president, but I think that he is playing by Queensberry's rules and he's being outmaneuvered by people. They maneuvered him into recusing himself and then ultimately maneuvered his deputy into appointing this the special investigator by the constant harping on the Russian hoaxing and putting so much pressure on them with the media that they felt that they had to do something. And that is buckling. That's not the fighting that Trump is looking for. So he's very frustrated because he sees these mechanisms put in the in place, which are legal mechanisms. I mean, this is Mueller is going to have tens of millions of dollars to essentially go on a witch hunt, a legal witch hunt, in which the consequences are very high for the people in Trump's circle. This is arrest, and believe me, you don't have to actually be guilty of anything to be walked into perjury traps and to be to be investigated to the nines. When you have a complicated business empire like Trump's, they're going to do a lot of guilt by association and try to find people who are one degree separated from him that are shady, and it's all dirty. It's all dirty operating. It's what D.C. does. And Trump and Sessions should never have allowed this to get out of the gate. He should never have allowed this to get out of the gate. He just shouldn't have. And so he's brought this on himself. I think the reason the president tweets is because he can't call Sessions into his office and say, I want this all to go away. Stop this. Because then it looks like it's collusion, like the president's ordering. I mean, he just got all of this crap for asking for Comey's loyalty in a private meeting. So... He knows he can't have a private meeting with Sessions, so I think the point of the tweeting is twofold. One is, is it's his way of communicating to Sessions in a public manner so that everybody sees him basically saying, I expect you to be loyal. And there's no behind-the-scenes backroom dealing at all. He's making it very public. And I think, second of all, to understand Trump is to understand where he comes from. A lot of people who have a instant sort of physical reaction to Trump's behavior are Midwesterners or Southerners or people who have a much more genteel style and grew up in a culture that was at least more polite on the surface. Trump comes from a New York City background, a Queens background that is that much more in your face and not about saying nice things to your face or bless your heart or those kinds of things. That's not who he is. And I think set, there's a little bit of a culture clash there because Sessions is not the, that, you know, Seth, Sessions is a Southern gentleman and it's that sort of New York front stabbing is not uh, in his nature. And Trump is basically, I believe, publicly calling on Trump, on Sessions to grow a pair, to get in the fight, to fight harder. And if he won't do that, to resign. So uh, if you read Conservative Treehouse, he goes into great detail about a lot of the swamp creatures that ex still exist at the FBI and the DOJ and that Sessions has not purged. Again, you've on this podcast, you've heard me talk about Scott Pruitt, who is the touchstone, the Rosetta Stone that I used in the rubric that I weigh everyone else against. Because Pruitt is a wrecking ball. He has come into the EPA pulling out the wires and firing on mass and driving people out because he knows that agency has to change. And I think there, there's an expectation from Trump that all of his cabinet members will do that. And Sessions is among a, ha a number that have not done it, but this is the one that's creating a real danger for President Trump by unleashing highly trained, focused, anti-Trump lawyers with unlimited budgets to come after him and his family. Our taxpayer money. So, again, I love Jeff Sessions. 
But to the extent that this is happening, he's brought it on himself. And he recently, the president tweeted about he wished that Sessions was focusing more on leaks. And now Sessions has announced that they're opening some investigations into leaks. So he's beginning to respond. But he really needs to step up his game. And ultimately, I believe that, that Mueller has to be fired. I realize that you got people like Lindsey Graham saying that'll be the end of his presidency. Well, that's what Lindsey Graham has wanted from day one. Lindsey Graham has never wanted a Trump presidency. I'm not worried about the D.C. media and the D.C. swamp having an aneurysm over him firing Mueller. I think he should announce a cybersecurity task force with Putin and invite Putin to a state dinner and announce joint military exercises. I think he ought to just go into the storm, right? Lean into the wind rather than constantly trying to pacify these folks because it's all a hoax anyway. And as we've talked about on this podcast, there isn't anything that's going on in Russia that isn't true in Turkey and nobody's losing their minds over Turkey. So... It's invented and it's phony and he ought to just ignore it and move forward. We should probably have a much better relationship with Russia and I'd like to see him begin to advance that cause. Okay, enough on that. Let's talk about the health care situation. I know that many people listening are not going to be surprised to hear that a bunch of Republican swamp creatures and never Trumpers are liars and they had no intention after they all, to a person, campaigned on repeal or repeal and replace of Obamacare, they had no intention of doing it. Now that they're being forced, and we've had a couple of votes in the last 48 hours, both to open debate and then on repeal and replace, and also on just straight repeal, and we have about a dozen Republican members who voted against one of those three votes that I've just laid out. And so they're all traitors, they're all liars, they're all essentially elite Republican, never Trump types. Who, have in, who enjoy the elite lifestyle that being a high-ranking member of our political class provides, but they don't actually believe the things that you believe. They parrot conservative talking points when they run for re-election, and then they don't mean it. And they're working hand-in-glove with Democrats and the global elites in this world. And they're the Washington generals. And they just announced themselves. They put on the jerseys in the last couple of days and said, yeah, our job's to throw the game. So who are these people? You're going to be surprised. I'm going to read the list, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes some of these people different from others. You have Tom, Tom Cotton from Arkansas, folks. Mike Lee from Utah. That great conservative Mike Lee from Utah. Corker from Tennessee, Bob Corker. And Lamar Alexander from Tennessee. So for those of you in Tennessee, both of your senators are liars and hoaxers. Lindsey Graham from South Carolina, no surprise. Jerry Moran from Kansas, the good people of Kansas, the good Republicans of Kansas, who I think would expect that they would have one of the most conservative members of Congress and the Senate, do not, in Jerry Moran. Dean Heller from Nevada. Shelley Moore Cap Capito from West Virginia, where something like 75% of the electorate voted for Donald Trump. Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, no surprise. Rob Portman of Ohio, Susan Collins of Maine, and John McCain, former Republican presidential candidate John McCain of Arizona. Now, let me say a couple of things about this list. First of all, this list is bigger than the names that I just read you. But these are the people who took the public votes. Why is it bigger? Because I guarantee you there are other members of our Republican majority who agreed with those votes, but they voted the way they needed to politically because they're up for re-election next year. I'm thinking of you, Jeff Flake, in Arizona. So the fact of the matter is, is that there are more than just these folks who would have voted no if they could, but some of them have to face the poor voters. Ick, mm, how unfortunate. And so they have to follow through on this promise that Republicans made. So that's the thing to understand is this, this is just the beginning of the list of people that are lying to you and think that they're smarter than you and think that you just need to hear platitudes like repeal and replace, but that they can nuance this later. Second of all, I'd warn you that the people who took these votes, especially the so-called conservatives like Mike Lee and Cotton, they're going to be hoaxing you big time over the next year as they try to spin this, that they were really, they're really conservative and the bill wasn't right or we need something different or they had some problem with something. I mean, believe me, they're going to have an explanation and it's going to be well rehearsed and thought out by 
very smart staff with college degrees from good universities, and they're going to have even poll tested it and focus grouped it before they roll it out. So when the siren song begins and you start to think, yeah, you know, Tom's making real sense. I can understand why he did that. You're going to have to slap your cr- yourself across the face and realize you're being duped by very sophisticated PR operations. The point is, is that they were put on notice here. They were given the opportunity to vote, and they didn't do it. They didn't do it. Now, I do want to separate out some of these folks who come from blue states. You have Susan Collins from Maine, and Dean Heller was the one I was trying to think of from Nevada, who, you know, that's a blue state. It's going to be a tough re-election for him next year. I'm still not happy with the fact that they voted that way, and they should be absolutely primaried out. Don't get me wrong. They should face primaries, and they should be taken out. But you would expect them to be weak-kneed or to vacillate because they come from purple states, essentially, or blue states, and those are difficult situations to run as a staunch conservative in. The people that I have absolutely no sympathy for are the McCains and the Cottons and Lees, who come from very red states, and they are just flat betraying you. I mean, they don't even have a good excuse, except that they just think so little of you. That's the point. Your job is to keep them in their elite, rarefied world, where they get basically treated like princes and called senator, which is is the equivalent of being called sir in this country. And they get six-figure salaries, and they get feted everywhere they go. I mean, believe me, these people are constantly at public speaking engagements where there's a five-minute introduction given, treating them like they're the second coming of Christ in the introductions. So they live very wonderful lives, eat the best foods, everything's great for them. And your job is to simply shut up Listen to their platitudes when they're running for re-election, like when John McCain tells you he's going to repeal and replace Obamacare and build the wall and all this stuff he said last year when he was running for re-election, and then let them go back to having their nice, wonderful life. One thing you'll notice about this list of people I read was that all of none of them are, well, with the exception of, of um, Heller, very few of them are up for re-election, especially the conservatives, the really conservative Republicans from red states. They're not up for re-election next year. The only ones on the list who are up for re-election next year are from blue states or purple states. So people like McCain just hoax you, they get re-elected, and then they spend those first three years of their six-year term basically betraying you. And then as their next re-election comes up, there isn't going to be another election for John McCain. But in general, my point is is that when their next election comes up, they start to get on board. They do what Jeff Flake does, which is that he just goes quiet and votes the way that he needs to and lets people like McCain carry the water. This is the kind of crap that these guys do. It's another one of the games they play where they understand when their re-elections are and they essentially pass off this baton. So, for instance, if this Obamacare vote were taking place two years from now, some of the people right now who have to run for re-election would be the no votes because they just got re-elected. And it would be people like Lisa Murkowski and others who'd be very quiet and be taking the right vote because their elections are coming up. So they understand this very well within their cloakroom and their backdoor dealings, and they know who's up for re-election and who isn't, and the people who aren't up for re-election, it's their job to go out and take the tough votes betraying us while the others hide in a corner. The only way to solve this is with primary campaigns. We talked about this in the last podcast, and you need to focus on one member. My suggestion for those of you in each state is pick one Republican member of your delegation who is the weakest on Trump and on these conservative issues and take them out. Take them out in the primary as an example to the others. Shooting one member of the desertion team usually focuses the mind of the rest of the troops. It's a nice club. And until you pull them out of it, they're not, you know, until they see someone getting pulled out of this elite club and made an example of, they're not going to start delivering. Let's talk about Anthony Scaramucci. He's the new communications director for the Trump administration. He's been on about a week. And there's some great videos of him out there dealing with the press this week. I think one of the things we love about him, Doris and I, is, is that he's basically right out of the Trump mold in that he's from New York, the New York City area, f- from the boroughs, and he is a front stabber. You know, he's somebody that goes right at you, and it, I, I am very attracted to this style of campaigning and, and politics because 
there's no veneer. And I know it's been very rough for people, especially on the Republican side, because there's a certain gentlemanliness that we expect, and Trump has broken all that down. And he's, we're the ones that have to get used to him. But anyways, Anthony's in this mold, and I know that, uh, that, that Doris has been loving every minute of it. Yes, I was listening to the UK interview with him this morning, and um, he said that he uh, lives in a town that manufactures scandals. In fact, he called D.C. Scandals Incorporated. And he says the elites and media very well realize there's nothing to the Russian story, but yet they proceed. And the most interesting thing he said, and this is a direct quote, he said, the president knows how to operate in an elitist world and has unbelievable empathy for the common struggle going on with the middle and lower class people. So for those people who say Trump is just a rich billionaire and he does, they don't understand how he relates to the little people, I think Scaramucci said it all in that statement. And he goes right at these reporters, you know. I mean, a 10-minute interview, if you're a Trump surrogate, is just 10 minutes of having a reporter be absolutely hostile to you from the get-go, interrupt you when you're trying to answer the question, and if you're succeeding in defeating their talking points, changing the subject very quickly and bringing something else in to try to get you off message. These are not pleasant interviews, and Scaramucci has done very well hammering back but again it's because he's a new yorker and you know and he's just not going to take crap i love it i love that he has appointed him he's perfect yeah it's going to be it's going to be and i think that i think that's what trump needs because it's that new york personality that makes trump who he is it's why we love him it's what makes him effective as a rather neophyte politician and I think that his communication strategy has to emulate that. It just doesn't work to take what he's doing on Twitter and what he's just doing as, as an administration and try to filter that through that sort of gentlemanly lens, you know, in a communications team. Like, they try to clean it up. Why clean it up? As Lewandowski said last year when they were running the campaign, let Trump be Trump. It's It works for him, and I think Scaramucci gets that, and... and he emulates him very, very well. And I think the, the communication strategy now is that when Trump is Trump and tweets or does whatever he does, the communications team is simply going to triple down on Trump. And that's the only way to go. He's the president of the United States, and you're not going to be able to spin it. And he doesn't want you to spin it. And you're not going to be able to knock the edges off it because he doesn't want you to knock the edges off it. And Scaramucci gets that. The president's giving it good and hard. We're just going to do it times three. And it's a lot of fun to watch. I think Scaramucci is going to be a lot of fun to watch as we go forward. And and I do think that there are going to be changes in the administration because I think some people that he's brought on, and look, he did this on purpose. He brought in some people who were not necessarily big fans of his because he was trying to create a big tent coalition to get things done. Now, it's clear that a lot of people in Congress have no intention of getting things done. So at some point, Trump, I think, can reassess and say, why do I have these people in my administration if it doesn't actually produce results in Congress? And I think for that reason, some people may go. There are some people who I think they're just, they can't pass up the opportunity to have power. So they're never Trumpers or they have a distaste for Trump, but they were given an opportunity to have immense power and they've taken it. And as time goes on, they can't stomach because they're not really true Trumpers and they can't stomach being on board and so some of them are going to fall off. I'm not sure who that is, but I think some people will fall off and then they'll immediately become darlings of the media as they badmouth the president. This is how that always goes. But that was the risk, the calculated risk that Trump took when he brought them into the camp, into the administration in an attempt to try to make peace with Republicans in Congress and to work together to get key things done of which they are failing. Look, what do we expect from the Congress this year? We expected them to repeal and replace Obamacare. We expected the tax reform and the infrastructure bill. And we expected budget cuts. We expected real reforms on the budget. And it looks as if the Republican Congress is going to be incapable of doing all of that. If they accomplish anything this year, it may be the tax reform. And by the way, that's not going to be a plus. If you're the Republican Congress and you fail to dramatically cut the budgets and you seem to be actually defending the budget levels where they're at, which is what a lot of these appropriations subcommittee chairs are doing, 
they're reacting with horror to the president's to the Republican president's budget cuts, and so they're acting like Democrats because their power is more important. If you're unable to cut the budget, you're unable to fulfill the number one promise you made to repeal and replace Obamacare and to and to do the infrastructure piece, which is the one that a lot of Trump's non-ideological Republican supporters wanted, the blue-collar voters out there wanted the infrastructure bill. If the only thing you can do is the tax cuts for the wealthier people and corporations, which I'm not necessarily against, I understand that that's going to goose the economy, but you you got to mix the vegetables in with the pudding. You do all of those things, and then you take the heat off of the tax cuts, which are necessary for economic growth. If you're incapable of getting the other stuff done, and then at the end of the year, the only thing you did was cut taxes, that looks gross. It's going to be very bad for the Republicans. And I'll predict right now that if that is the only significant accomplished accomplishment that they make, and that allows the media to focus solely on the tax cuts going into the election year, they may not hold the Congress. I, I think it's very difficult for Democrats to get the Senate based on who's up for re-election, which is, again, why a bunch of Republican senators are acting badly, because they don't fear the next cycle. But it is very possible for Democrats to win back the House if Republicans or voters especially are dejected and disheartened by a Congress that has all the power and can't deliver on these things and manages only to deliver for, the, for Wall Street, essentially. Again, I'm not against the tax reform. That needs to happen. But anybody who knows anything about politics will tell you that, you've, that that speaks to a certain element of the Republican coalition. And you need to pass those other things to make sure you're ringing the bell for everyone else in the Republican coalition or you're, you're just looking like you serve the elites. And that feeds right into the perfect narrative for the Democrats going into the election cycle, and it's a bad recipe. So I've gotten a lot of questions from friends about Russia and China and why DC is so obsessed with Russia and and what the difference is between the two and and I want to talk a little bit about why what it is that I think how how I believe that DC is oriented towards Russia and China and then how I think that Trump is different and again why he causes heads to explode in DC so America's foreign policy elites have been pretty consistent over the last few decades on the issue of China and Russia. Uh, let's state on the outset that both countries have pluses and, minus and minuses, and both of them can be bad actors. For the most part, though, elite American opinion is that China is a net good and Russia is a net bad. But why? Why do they feel this way? And let me give you a couple of reasons. First of all, remember that there's still a lot of leftists in the foreign policy establishment. Leftists had a 100-year history of championing international socialism, communism, and anti-nationalism. For many decades, Moscow, which ran the Com Intern, was the Mecca, or the Vatican, if you will, of the worldwide Marxist movement. Yes, China was communist, but it was much more internal, and it never led the international communist movement, international socialist movement in any significant way, the way that Moscow did for 70 years. Most of the guerrilla organizations in the world that were the leftist communist guerrilla organizations were funded by Moscow. The uh, so, uh, Many anti-left organizations in the United States were funded by Moscow. This was something the Chinese just weren't doing. In the 1990s, Russia not only abandoned communism, but it embraced, get ready for the heresy, it embraced capitalism. Now, sure, it was a crony form of capitalism, but nonetheless, it embraced capitalism. And so did China, eventually. But in embracing capitalism, in the fall of the Soviet Union, all of that funding and support from Moscow stopped. That's the key part. And there's a lot of bitterness and deep-seated anger Oh, in the aging communist community in the world and in the United States about the loss of this communist Camelot that was the Soviet Union. This is a factor in elite opinion, but mostly on the left. And it's not the largest one. More importantly, I want to talk about the difference between China and Russia as bad actors, the kinds of bad actors they are. China, for the most part, is a bad actor economically to the outside world. What they do, essentially, is to cheat on capitalism. They're always 
sort of violating the WTO and they don't respect our intellectual property rights and those kinds of things. They do a lot of bad things internally, but that doesn't affect people outside of China. It certainly doesn't affect elites. But the cheating on capitalism does. Okay. Well, the left hates capitalism. So they've never really been that bothered by China's cheating on capitalism. Russia is a different story. Russia is a bad actor politically to the outside world. They put political and sometimes military pressure on Eastern Europe and the Middle East. Besides the fact that American leftists have always leaned towards European concerns, this area of affairs, the, a political arena, is the center of the leftist world. They care a lot more about politics than they do about economics. This they care about. So the Russians cheating politically is much more of a sin to our foreign policy establishment than China cheating economically. And here's the change. Donald Trump is a capitalist. He cares a lot more about the American economy than he does about politics. So obviously, looking at the same two bad actors, it's easy to see why he would find China's economic cheating much more troublesome than Russia's political cheating. One element of the Trump doctrine will clearly be that economic bad actors are to be considered worse than political bad actors. Now, that is the exact opposite of the way our D.C. establishment feels. So he's upending nearly three decades or more of consensus in Washington, D.C. So I submit that the U.S. relationship with Russia is likely to improve under Trump, while our relationship with China will likely deteriorate. And the foreign policy establishment and the left will be flipping out, and we can expect endless essays that excoriate Trump for this reversal, this very fundamental reversal. That, I believe, is the difference between China and Russia and Trump and the D.C. establishment. So there was a recent poll that suggested 42% of the public wants Trump impeached, and 42% said that they do not want the president impeached. Now, that's a pretty stark poll result and shows a really divided country. Because when you're talking about impeachment, you're talking about civil civil war. I mean, removing a president is, I mean, the next step would be violent revolution, right? So it this is pretty severe that 42% of the country wants a, a duly elected president of the United States impeached. And also that the same percentage of Americans do not want that to happen. There's there's a, a Grand Canyon between those two groups of folks, and we need to recognize that. I wonder what the 16% want. Don't know, probably, or, or mild. You know, they're the she <laughs> I mean, not only are the sheeple in there, but in any poll, you have people in the middle who just aren't paying attention, you know, don't have a strong opinion one way or another. The press is very focused on this polarization in our country right now. And it concentrates on depicting the evil right, which they like to claim is uncompromising and extreme. Of course, that ignores the last 50 years of the left, which has been uncompromising and extreme and gotten its way. But the truth is, we are not united. And as this gets worse, because it's going to get worse, not better, there are going to be all sorts of calls for unity and people who will bring up words like patriotism and who will warn about how bloody and awful the last civil war was and certainly we want to avoid that and they'll talk about our shared history now who's going to do that it's going to come from both the left and our useless republican elite it'll come from the left and they'll just be lying because they don't believe any of that stuff patriotism and unity and stuff but they know those are buzzwords that work on the right and so they're going to hope to get us calmed and back down to sleep uh, using those kinds of soothing words. But more in a more sinister fashion, though, it's going to come from our Republican elites, perfumed, hanky Republicans, the never-Trumper types, the, the Washington generals, who've been losing gracefully and getting paid well to do it for decades and don't want to rock the boat. And they, of course, can't stand the idea that everything's gotten so ununified and that everything's gotten so nasty, because to them, that's worse than actually fighting the left to victory. And that's the truth of the matter, is as we've talked about repeatedly in this podcast, I wish that we could have a peaceful society. I wish that we could have unity. But anybody 
who spends time understanding the left and how it operates, understands that they will never stop. And they will never settle for half measures. Look at what's going on with transgenders in the military. It's not enough to get gay marriage. It's not enough to get people treated with respect. They've got to shove this further and further into the extreme, having people who have mental health problems foisted on the military. And it makes no sense, but it's because they are relentless and they will not quit and they have to be defeated. And you can only defeat them by meeting them on the field of battle with their tactics and their weapons. And that means things have to get unpleasant and polarized. And the worst actors in all of this are the Republicans on our side that will betray us by siding with these false siren song calls from the left that we need more unity and we have to avoid a civil war and everybody just needs to calm down and we have to get back to listening to each other and compromising. It's all designed to get Republicans to go back to sleep. That's what they want. The left wants a radical change in this country and there's no compromising with that. It will either be their way or it won't. And I wish that that weren't true. But surrender is the price of unity. So if we're going to win, it's going to get a lot worse. And that's a decision for each person listening to my voice to make for themselves. How much can you stand? How much are you up for the fight? People may need to take some breaks, but the truth of the matter is is that the pro this process with Trump has just begun. It's just begun. And the left hasn't even shown you their full-throated violent resistance. If you think it's bad now, wait till the winning continues on the part of Trump and the Trump administration. The globalists and the, and the elites in our society are not going to surrender. So the point of this segment is to simply encourage you to ignore those siren songs because they are going to be quite enticing. This idea of, oh, we all, we all salute the same flag. We all support the same constitution. It's Barbara Streisand. It's BS. We don't all... Salute the flag. Look at Colin Kaepernick. I mean, the evidence is out there and it's overwhelming. The left has no interest in forming a unified country with us. They want us to unify behind the country they're going to create. A socialist, globalist, unfree collective. They're happy to talk about that unity. So resistance is going to be unpleasant. And it's going to continue to be unpleasant. And I can't spare you from that. But if you fall for these weasel words they're gonna look we're the ones on our side we're the ones that are patriotic we're the ones that love this country we're the ones that support the military believe in femininity and masculinity and these and the family and basic concepts you know that have propelled this country to greatness and so when people start talking about those things and they write clever songs we're we're lovable dupes we fall for that stuff we want to believe that the country can be unified and that we can all sing kumbaya and get together and fight a common enemy or what have you. But when that stuff comes, it's going to come from Hollywood and the liberal commanding heights. And when it's the leftists, they're lying with a big smile on their face. They're just trying to see how much you'll bite like Pavlov's dog, how much you'll salivate when they roll that crap out to deceive us. And then they'll be aided by Republicans, the never-Trumper types, the McCains and Lindsey Grahams of the world, who also believe that we'll simply salivate when the music's played and fall in line and stop resisting. So Doris and I saw Dunkirk this week, actually. We saw it earlier this week. Yeah, it's a World War II thriller about the evacuation of Allied troops from the French city of Dunkirk before the Nazi forces can take hold. It's really interesting because there was almost no dialogue in the movie, yet it's intense, suspenseful, and has stunning visuals, and I thought it was beautifully done, and it sure shows what a lot of people gave up for freedom. So I want your reaction to a couple of things, Doris, about the movie, which I thought was quite good. First of all, director Nolan, who did the Dark Knight series, and he did Interstellar, and I liked Interstellar a lot. It's one of my favorite movies from that from the last few years. He tried a very novel trick time-wise in this movie. He told three stories. He told the story of the soldiers on the beach over the course of a week. He told the story of one 
civilian boat that left from England to go over to Dunkirk to pick up survivors over the course of one day. That story takes place over one day. And then he has a pilot, a British uh, RAF pilot, who is trying to protect the troops on the beach, who has one hour's worth of fuel in his plane. So his story takes place over one hour. So the movie is telling all three stories at the same time, but they have different lengths. And so certain scenes get repeated, but from another actor's, you know, so one, t one time we see the scene from the soldiers on the beach, and then later on in the movie, we might see that same moment from the airline, from the pilots, uh, the aircraft pilots, point of view and then we might also see that same moment from the little ship captain's point of view what did you think about that device and how that played out were you able to follow it and did you like it yes i think it was a risky thing to try to put together but i followed it quite well and i thought it was very effective i noticed that uh everyone in the movie was white because that was britain in the, in the late 30s and there's already a bunch of leftist reviewers out there who are commenting on the fact that well, it had to be that way because that you can't retcon history. Retconning is when you try to recondition history and 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 just change what actually happened to fit the current narrative. Is like they a lot of them wished that maybe they you know Nolan had taken some risks and put a bunch of um, different races in there, like Star Trek, just because you know hey it doesn't have to be totally faithful to history, and we need to give actors of different races a chance to play in these movies. I, I mean, a lot of them said it was basically a good movie in spite of the fact that it had an all-white cast. Oh, well, if I have to have one uh, criticism of the movie was that you never saw any blood. And it was uh, difficult to realize that all these dead people on the beach from bombs uh, didn't bleed. Some of them, I agree that some of them were the victims of bombs um, and or strafing and there probably would have been some blood or some blood spatter and we didn't see that I wonder though and I, I need to read some more interviews I wonder if Nolan didn't do his homework though and maybe what he was trying for was realism because a lot of us are very used to the way bodies are shot or the way blood and guts happens in the movies we've never actually seen it in real life somebody strafed by a plane or or blown up by a bomb, although many veterans now, unfortunately, have had that experience. And so maybe it's not as bloody, and maybe the um, the sounds of the bullets aren't... I know for a fact that the sounds of bullets are enhanced in movies, and the gun, even the gun recoil sounds are enhanced in movies, and that in real life, guns don't... aren't quite as... they don't quite make that thunderous a sound. And so it may be that he was trying for more realism and that it, it seems odd to us because we're so used to things being hyped in a movie. But I, I agree that there were certain moments involving strafing and bombing when we, that should have been a little bit bloody or, or there, there, you know, it, it should have been, and it wasn't. You know, he never shows the Germans. They're just referred to as the enemy and they're never shown. Everything is from the British perspective in that way. It, it, there were some very interesting elements to the film. Talk about that opening scene that I thought was so effective with the papers coming down. Well, there's a couple of British soldiers who are sort of casually walking as leaflets from the Germans saying, you're surrounded. You know, these leaflets say that. But they're not really worried. They're just sort of walking. And then suddenly a sniper opens up on them and, and most of them are killed and they have to run for cover. And it becomes clear that they're actually very close to the beach. And that when one of the soldiers makes it to the beach, he essentially exits the city, the town, and the walls, and then he's like suddenly on the beach. It's like a total transition from one universe to the other, even though there's clearly warfare going on, heavy warfare between the French and the Germans, just, you know, a thousand yards away, everything's quiet on the beach because you can just hear the sounds of the water. And then... There's this wonderful element of line queuing. You know, he gets on the beach and all the men are sort of lined up. They're just queued up to get on the boats, the boats that aren't coming. And so they're all just standing there on the beach in a line. And what does he do? He just immediately gets in line because, and I've read a little bit about this, this is very British. The British are very calm, sort of line queuing people. And when they see a line, even when they don't know exactly where it's going or who's solving the problem of the line, they just get in the line and they tend to sit there very patiently. This is a cultural thing, and 
it's amusing to watch him, you know, after just being in this death defying moment, he he gets on the beach and he sees a line queuing. And what does he do? He just sort of docilely gets at the back of the line. Eventually he starts to figure out that he needs to get out. I mean, the character we're following in the beach figures out that he's got to get out of that line and he starts looking for some ways to move to the front of the line. It's an all British cast. Tom Hardy plays the pilot and he does a really good job especially because he's kind of like bane his character bane from uh the the dark knight trilogy because he's got this mask over his face the whole time he has to talk into but he he doesn't speak a lot and that was very real he has a little bit of communication with his fellow pilot in another plane and then after a while he's on his own and he's monitoring his fuel and he's making decisions about whether he can stay or go to, you know, continue to help men on the ground and the ships or whether, you know, he doesn't have enough fuel. But he, we watch all of that happen without him speaking. And with most of his face co- covered. I mean, we can only basically see his eyes. And yet, these were very emotional moments. I was with him. I understood exactly what he was thinking when he was looking at that plane in the mirror and making the decision about whether to stay or go. I, it was a very dramatic moment, very well done by Timothy Nolan, without any dialogue whatsoever as you watch this pilot make a decision that he believes probably is going to cost him his life to save others. And those were the best moments in the movie. This British stoicism from that period of knowing what the right thing to do is and doing it without a lot of dialogue. Especially the people that came over with their boats. Yeah, just uh, just private yachts coming over to try to to ferry men to the destroyers or to take them all the way back to England. So your recommendation is? Oh, it's an A. The movie's an A. I definitely recommend it. It's one of the, you know, it's probably one of only three or four movies we've seen this year that I would definitely recommend going and seeing in the theater. I mean, when somebody takes this much care to make a really good movie, I think that it's, it's on us to reward them with the ticket sale and not wait for it to come out on cable or what have you. You know, they make their most money on the, uh, on the theatrical ticket sales. And so, you know, I'll just say it again. You know, if somebody's made a really good movie, I I like to encourage people to go and see it because the artists involved in that should be rewarded. And I think some leftist reviewers were trying to read their own politics into that movie, but it's not. I mean, it is definitely a conservative movie. It is not a modern social justice warrior movie of any kind. And uh, it's definitely pro-allied and pro-Western civilization and pro-male. And it's a good movie. It's, and it's tense. Boy, there's this sense of tension that Nolan is able to create in the film. I mean, I felt it very keenly about halfway through. I'm like, geez, this movie just is tense. And it can, you know, it, it very, even though he switches scenes and he gives you just, basically he takes the tension from like one up to nine and then when he switches to another scene, the tension only really falls back to like six. And then he starts ratcheting it up again. So you never really get relief because he only lets the tension fall back a little bit before he starts to turn the crank again. And it's not a very long movie and it's engrossing. I, I definitely recommend it. What are the other really good movies that we've seen this year. I, I guess Lion doesn't count because it came out technically last year, but I definitely recommend Lion. I thought Wonder Woman was the best comic book movie that came out. That was very good. I really liked Wonder Woman. And I like Baby Driver, too. Doris will recommend that one. I probably won't, but I, I would add Guardians of the Galaxy. This The number two, that was a... Those were both, you know, the Wonder Woman and Guardians of the Galaxy movie are mindless. I mean, they're not anything sophisticated, but they were fun. And uh, I, I would recommend those over the others that have come out. I do get some questions sometimes about my professional history and so I will answer that here in this podcast to give you just a sense of where I've been and where these opinions are coming from. Uh, I grew up in Oregon in a suburb was pretty I would say I was left-leaning but only in the sense that I just imbibed the culture. I think kids in suburbia have very little interaction with the real world and most of what we understand we understand from movies and and tv so i took that off to college and went to usc in los angeles and i was there for the riots in 1992 and that was educational 
And then I originally I wanted to go to the film school, uh, but that's a very difficult film school to get into. When I was there, it's gotten worse, but when I was there, they would get about 900 applications a semester, and they would take nine people, nine to 18. So it was very, very difficult to get in, and ultimately ended up going into the journalism school and, and getting a degree in broadcast journalism. And I worked, uh, interned at a television station in Portland, and then ultimately got my first job in Yakima, Washington. And I started out as the agricultural reporter there and ultimately was covering politics and crime, covered murder trials. Yakima is uh, kind of the murder capital of Washington State. I, I, uh, I can't really name places all across the country that would be an equivalent, but for those of you in California, it's kind of like Fresno. And, and they had a high immigrant population, illegal immigrant population, high, high um, um, poverty, and high crime rate. I mean, we would get about 16 to 20 murders a year, but in a town the size of Yakima, that's extraordinary. And that was made it the murder capital of Washington State. But uh, all that crime made it fascinating to be a crime reporter. And that was really my journey, uh, started my journey on the right. Uh, to the right was a couple of things. It was, first of all, as I've spoken before on a podcast, it was about actually meeting all the people that make the community of Yakima work and figuring out who the Republicans were and who the Democrats were and understanding that the Republicans were all the core people that that made the civilization work and solved the problems and that Democrats tended to represent the fringes of society. So that was one of my very early understandings. Now, I didn't use those words. It, it took reading Steve Saylor's columns 15, 20 years later to understand what I had seen in those words. But certainly I understood who was really vital to the community and cared in a way, really put their money in their mouths where it mattered. And then covering crime. And, you know, when I was a reporter, I didn't watch the news on the television. I provided the news on the television. So it was my job to go out and actually see how things worked. I provided the filter, if you will. And that was eye-opening. And certainly covering crime, and there's nothing like it's portrayed on television. Matter of fact, the only TV show that I think has done a good job about portraying crime and cops is The Wire. And I would recommend people watch those four seasons. It's an excellent show and very, very, not only is it very realistic, but once you've watched that show, you realize how all the Law and Orders and NYPD Blues and all of those things are just Hollywood sensationalized versions of those occupations and the crime courts world. Uh, the Wire is very good. But I, I, I had that experience firsthand as a reporter and, you know, I... I went to people's arraignments who were charged with pretty despicable crimes and I could I could see evil in people's eyes. I mean you can just see the vacancy in folks and it absolutely convinced me that, that you know about the need for the death penalty and the fact that certain people the wiring is broken and they cannot be let out. They cannot be let out. So that was eye opener because it just wasn't something that I watched on the TV. I went and got into close proximity to this and when you see families that are destroyed by somebody's callous action or the murder of their loved one, you know, that focuses your mind as well. And then on top of that, the what really started my movement on the right was the environmental movement, especially when I started out as an ag reporter. When I was living in a rural area and seeing the way rural people were treated by urban people, urban voters who see some television ad with a crying animal or whatever, and then they stampede to vote a certain way without ever really having any experience in a rural area or how that's going to affect rural people. I mean, a good example is, I've seen this happen in, here in Oregon, it's easy to get suburban and urban people, especially moms, to vote to ban cougar hunting. And the cougars are out in the rural area. So it's rural families whose children, and who, when they're jogging or when they're outside, they're in real danger from being taken down by a big cat. And I've noticed that as soon as these cougars start showing up on the outskirts of the suburban Portland metropolitan area, suddenly people's minds change about cougar hunting. When it's, you know, when somebody finds out that a cougar was seen near their kid's bus stop, boy, that focuses the mind. And uh, time and time and time again, I saw the kind of abuses that are perpetrated on rural people because they don't have the votes. And, they, and the people who are doing the voting over in the urban areas don't spend any time out in the rural areas. They have absolutely no understanding of that lifestyle whatsoever. And it's easy for a lot of these environmental groups to run a 60-second ad or to get some story published 
and and convince people of a bunch of false notions. And I became very protective of rural people who I had no affinity from. I had grandparents that were from Oklahoma, but that was about as close as, you know, having any kind of personal connection to the rural area for me. But I became very protective of the way rural people are treated. And when I saw the kind of lying and hoaxing that goes on in the environmental community, and they do outright lie because they absolutely believe that the ends justify the means. And I turned very sour on a lot of the bullcrap that I had, you know, been fed in school and the rest uh, by the environmental community. And once I started questioning that and saying, gosh, you know, if these leftists in the environmental community are liars and hoaxers and, and will say and do anything to get their way, who else does that? And of course, once I started asking that question up and down on the left, I began moving to the right. And of course, one of the things I've had to deal with in the last few years post my career in the state legislature, uh, you know, I, it's not a total shock, but certainly Trump has opened my eyes to the amount of hoaxing and lying that goes on in the Republican Party as well. Certainly there are a lot more well-intentioned, honest people in the, on the Republican side, but not at the elite level, not the folks who are actually the decision makers, you know, who take the votes. So after um, some time in central Washington, I, I, as a reporter, I went to work for the congressman there and worked a few years for him, a Republican, and then came back to Oregon and did some public relations work for, a, well, I, I had a public relations company for about 11 years and ultimately ran for the state legislature and served in the Oregon state legislature. I did that because... I was working on projects to try to advance school choice and school reform. Oregon's very behind in that kind of stuff. Um, some of the best school reform measures have been passed in states that have large minority populations, blacks especially, but sometimes Hispanics, because you can usually get some Democrats that represent those communities to turn against the teachers union and vote for school reforms. And that's where it's, it's tended to be advanced most successfully around the country. Oregon's very white, doesn't tend to have very large minority populations, and so the Democrats here are very basically kind of uh, white elitist Democrats, and there's very little minority representation in the, in the Democrat Party in Oregon. So we've been very behind in, in education reform, and I w had been working for many years on projects to try to get it advanced, and it became clear to me that Again, you're seeing this play out in D.C., but I began to realize that if you weren't a part of that Republican caucus at the legislature, then they weren't listening to you. You know, it's an elite club, and it was no way to penetrate it from the outside. So the, the, my decision to run for the legislature wasn't because I really wanted to be in the legislature or even to be a politician. I just knew that if I wasn't a member of that caucus, I, I couldn't advance school choice and school reform. And no one else in the Republican caucus was willing to be the champion for that. So ultimately served two terms, and then uh, there was a whole bunch of uh, crap that occurred around uh, Republicans, unfortunately, who are very self-sabotaging in Oregon. Oregon has one of the weakest Republican part, state parties in the country and least effective, and that's why the Democrats have complete control of the state. We're basically the Vermont of the West Coast, and that's mostly due to just ineptitude on the part of of the the Republican elites in this state. And I left the legislature, finished my term, and left the legislature about five, well, it's been about five, six years ago. And uh, then I spent some time traveling. I kind of just needed to take a break from all of it and sold a bunch of assets and put the money in the bank and just uh, went wherever the notion took me and spent a bunch of time traveling around Europe and Asia. And there's nothing that can take the place of seeing these places for yourself, interacting with people, and 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 unfortunately, even though I didn't want to, talking about politics. People, when they know you're American, they want to talk about politics, so uh, I ended up in a lot of those conversations, but I learned a lot about how Italians and Hungarians and Chinese folks feel about America and about politics in general, and that was very eye-opening, and, and it allowed me to understand a lot more about what Steve Saylor writes about on VDARE. There are real cultural differences between people. And that became very clear as I traveled. And just because people move to the United States and become Americans doesn't mean they don't bring those cultural differences with them. 
So I learned a lot of my travels, and, and that, in a nutshell, is uh, who I am and where these opinions come from. Doris? Oh, I thought it was interesting when you communicated home and said that 60% of the people that you met felt that 911 that we were responsible for 911. I was shocked by that. A lot of Europeans believe that the American government was responsible for 911. And that was disappointing. I want to be very clear that I I flatly reject that and do not believe it. But, you know, it shows you the power of the media though out there. I mean, one thing I saw in Europe especially is that there's nothing even remotely close to Fox News in Europe. It is all, I mean, MSNBC would be considered conservative in the media in Europe. Most of their media is pretty state-controlled or, or heavily state-influenced, and the governments of Europe are very left-leaning for the most part. And so what Europeans get filled with, what the voters get filled with, is a lot of very left stuff, which is why Republican presidents are never treated very well, because they just get the worst versions of themselves portrayed in, in Europe. And you can imagine, if, if the people of Europe only saw Rachel Maddow, if that was their only version, think of how they'd feel about Republicans. And It's amazing, though, how many of them are actually able to see past that. But a lot of Europeans are duped by that coverage. And so because there's a tremendous amount of um, you know, media sympathy for this idea that the, the U.S. government is so evil that it would murder its own people like that to advance a foreign policy... Uh, a lot of them believe it. Now, I know there are Americans that believe that too, um, but I, when I wrote Doris, I, my estimation based on my interactions with people was that close to 60% of Europeans believe that to be the case. And I would have expected you know, some small percentage to believe that. It just shocked me at how, how many did. We're about out of time. This is a labor of love, but we need to grow. I'm hoping you'll recommend this podcast to others. Please like our show in whatever whatever app or program you're using to listen to it. You are not alone. Goodbye, Doris. Goodbye, Matt.